Hello, Assalamualaikum. My name is Nur Afika binti Abdul Halim and today I want to introduce about Ghost Cider and Jacobi Method. Let's move to Ghost Cider. Ghost Cider Method is an improved form of Jacobi Method and it also known as the Successive Displacement Method. Ghost Cider Method always applies the latest updated values during the iterative procedure and the reason why the Gauss Cider method is commonly known as the successive displacement method because the second unknown is determined from the first unknown in the current iteration. The third unknown is determined from the first and second unknowns. Based on theory, the convergence occurs much quicker for the Gauss Cider method than Jacobi method. So we move to Jacobi method. Jacobi method is one and iterative methods for approximating the solution of a system of n linear equation in n variables. Jacobi method is also known as the simultaneous displacement method and about the convergence, it much slower than Gauss cider. Greetings everyone, my name is Vyashini, daughter of Subramaniam and my metric ID is D20201095684. Next, I'll continue with system of linear equations using Gauss cider by hand. So for this, we will be using gauss seidel method to solve this equation and uh, obtain the value for x1, x2 and x3. So uh, the, the total number of equations used are three equations where the first equation is 4x1 plus x2 plus 3x3 equals to 70. And the second equation is x1 plus 5x2 plus x3 equals to 14. And the third equation is 2x1 minus x2 plus 8x3 equals to 12. So this will be the three equations that we will be using. From the three given equation, how can you solve it to obtain the value of x1, x2 and x3? First of all, by using that equation, you have to uh, take x1, x2 and x3 and make it as three different subjects. Okay, you have to derive it into three different subjects. Where the first equation, you have to make x1 as a subject where x2 and x3 will be your terms. And then the second equation, your x2 will be your subject, your x1 and x3 will be your terms. And the, for the third equation, your x3 will be your subject and your x1 and also x2 will be your terms. Based on what I told just now, uh, for the first one, we have to make x1 as the subject. So we will move all other expressions to the other side to make x1 as a subject where we obtain 1 over 4 in bracket 70 minus x2 minus 3x3. This is what we obtain after moving all other expressions to the other side to make x1 as the subject. Next, for uh, to make x2 as the subject, we have to move all other expressions to the other side to make x2 as the subject, where your uh, equation will be x2 equals to 1 over 5 in bracket 14 minus x1 minus x3. Okay, and for the third equation, you have to move, uh, you have to make x3 as your subject, where all other expressions are moved to the other side. And the final equation is 1 over 8 uh, in bracket 12 minus 2x1 plus x2. Now, you already have your equation for x1, x2 and x3. So what do you need to do next? Next is your initial gauss. Initial gauss will be x1, x2 and x3 will be 0. Okay, your initial gauss is 0. So once your initial gauss is 0, for the first approximation, since you don't have any values yet, you only have your initial gauss which is 0. So for that equation, look at x1. Your x1 equation just now was 1 over 4 in bracket 17 minus x2 minus 3x3. Okay, so here we have to substitute since we don't have any value, so we have to substitute x2 and x3 with 0. Okay, once you substitute uh, with 0, you will obtain 4.25. Once you obtain 4.25, the next equation, you have already have your x2 equation also, right? x2 equation was 1 over 5, 14 minus x1 minus x3. So here we have 1 over 5 and then 14 minus x1 value. We have already obtained x1 value, which is 4.25. So you don't have to use that 0 anymore. You have already have your x1 value. So we will be using 4.25 and minus x3. Since we don't have x3 value yet, we will be using that 0. So once we solve that, we will get 1.95. For x3, the same thing, 1 over 8 in bracket 12 minus 2 x1 plus x2. So now, do we have the value of x1 and x2? Yes, but we don't have the value for x3. We are going to find now, right? So we don't have the value for x. Uh, we got the value for x1 and x2, but we don't have the value for x3. So that is what we are going to find now. So x1 and x2, since we have the value, we can straight away substitute that value into the equation, which is 1 over a in bracket 12 minus 2. X1 value was 4.25 plus x2 value was 1.95. So once you solve that equation, you will get 0 0.6812. Okay, next for second approximation, the same thing, we are going to do the same thing, just like this now, for x1, 
we have obtained the value of x2 which is from your first approximation so your first approximation your x2 was 1.95 right so we will be substituting x2 1.95 and also for our x3 we will be substituting 0.6812 so where we obtain these values from from the first approximation for x1 so once we calculate it we will get 3.2516 okay next for x2 the same thing but now for the equation we have 1 over 5 in bracket 14 minus x1 minus x3 right so now i want to ask you do we have to use the equation the x1 value do we have to use from the first approximation or from the second approximation we have to use the latest one right so we have to use from the second approximation just now we found our x1 value for second approximation right so we have to use that latest value so always remember once you already get your latest value for gauss seidel method especially for this method once you got your latest value you have to straight away substitute that value into your current equation because you already have that latest value so you don't have to go back for your own value again so the same thing you substitute that value you will get 2.0134 and then for your third equation, for the third equation also same thing, x3, you have to find x3, so 1 over 8 in bracket 12 minus 2x1 plus x2. In this case, same thing, you have already obtained your x1 value for your second approximation, that is your latest x1 value, and also x2 value for your second approximation, that is your latest x2 value. So you have already obtained this value, you have to substitute that value. Okay, for your x1, you have to substitute 3.2516, for your x2, you have to substitute 2.0134. For the third approximation, it's the same thing, the same step again and again. Okay, for your x1, you have to substitute your current value from your second approximation. For your x2, you have to substitute the current value from your uh, x1. You have already got your x1, but you don't have your x3 yet. So x3, you have to take from the second approximation. And then for your x3, you have uh, x1 and x2. You have already got that value, so you substitute back that value into your x3 equation. So once you substitute, you will get x1 equals to 3.0425, x2 equals to 2.0037, x3 equals to 0.9898. In this case, why we are taking four decimal places is because we want to get a better value. We don't want a value that is far away from, uh, from the actual value. So we have to take more decimal places so that we can obtain the uh, correct value. Same thing for the fourth approximation. You have to use back the same equation for x1, x2, x3. And you will be obtaining uh, for x1, you will get 3.0067. For x2, you will get 2.0007 for x3 you will be getting 0.9984 and then for the fifth approximation the same step continues and you will be getting x1 equals to 3.001 x2 equals to 2.0001 x3 equals to 0.9998 then for the sixth approximation you will be continuing the same step also and you will be getting x1 equals to 3.002 x2 equals to 2 x3 equals to 1 so now you you might ask me Teacher, when, uh, until when should I continue this? Should I just continue this until 10th, 11th, 12th approximation? No. How you can see the approximation is your last two approximations, the value for x1, x2 and x3 have to be nearly same. So in this case, for this question, if we look at the, okay, let's look at the next table. Look at the table here. The equation for the first approximation until the sixth approximation has been listed down for x1, x2 and also x3 values. It's easier for you if you, ta uh, if you tabulate it into a form of table so that you can see the difference between your last two approximations and you can conclude, okay, wait, I have to do until this only. Okay, if not, you can't be continuing until 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th because you have already obtained. How, how can you decide? Okay, now I've already got the value that is uh, approximately same, that is uh, close to each other so i don't have to continue how can you conclude okay if you look here for the fifth iteration and also sixth iteration you can see for the fifth iteration for x1 you got 3.001 for x2 you got 2.001 for x3 you got 0 0.9998 and then for the sixth iteration you got 3.0002 uh, for the x2 you got 2 and for x3 you got 1 so the values for x1 x2 and x3 for the fifth iteration and also sixth iteration is almost the same Okay, but if you compare it with uh, the fourth iteration, the fourth iteration is further away. It's 3.0067, but this one is 3.001 and 3.0002. So that is near, but then 3.0067 is further away. For the X2, it's 2.0007, but for the fifth iteration, it's 2.001. So it's further away. You have to still continue because it's further away. It's not closer to each other. So this is how you get the iterations value uh, for the first approximation until the sixth approximation for X1, X2 and also X3 value using Gauss-Seidel method. So the final answer will be X equals to 3.002, which is approximately 3, Y equals to uh, approximately 2, and Z equals to approximately 1. So that's all from me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Norfaranakia binti Madhairi. My matrix number D2020109465.
and I'm going to explain about how to solve the system of linear equation using Gauss Jacobi by hand. So here we have three matrices that we need to solve which is for x1 plus x2 plus 3x3 equal to 17 and x1 plus 5x2 plus x3 equal to 14 and 2x1 minus x2 plus 8x3 equal to 12. And then from the equation above, we need to search for x1, x2 and x3 which is x1 from first row, x2 from second row and x3 from third row. And then we will get x1 equal to 1 over 4 times 17 minus x2 minus 3x3. For x2, we will get 1 over 5 times 14 minus x1 minus x3 and for x3, equal to 1 over 8 times 12 minus 2x1 plus x2 and then make an initial guess of the solution for x1, x2 and x3 so here the initial cost is 0 and then to obtain the first approximation we need to substitute this value into the right hand side of the rewritten equation and we will get the new value which is x1 equal to 4.25, x2 equal to 2.8 and x3 equal to 1.5. Then this accomplish one iteration. In the same way, compute the second approximation by substitute the first approximation x1, x2 and x3 value into the right hand side equation. Repeating this process until 12 approximation, after 12 steps, the value x1, x2, x3 have stabilized at the true solution which is x1 equal to 3, x2 equal to 2 and x3 equal to 1. From the table above, we can see that because the last two columns in the table which is iteration 11 and iteration 12 are identical, you can conclude that two three significant digits, the solution is x1 equal to 3 x2 equal to 2 and x3 equal to 1. For the system of linear equation given, the Jacobi method is said to be converged, that is, repeated iterations succeed in producing an approximation that is correct to the three significance digit. As is generally true for iterative method, greater accuracy would require more iteration. So, this is how to apply the Jacobi method to approximate the solution of the following system of linear equation given. Thank you. Hi everyone, okay so in this video, I'm going to show you how to solve a system of linear equations using gauss seidel method in Mathematica. So firstly, this is the code that I'll be using, where A will be declared as the matrix A with 3 times 3 dimension, B declares the matrix B with 3 elements or the right hand side of the equation, and X1 is going to be the initial or starting point of the iteration. D1 here shows the element of diagonal in the system, and D2 creates the diagonal in the form of a matrix, and capital L declares as the lower triangular matrix of A, and is subtracted with the diagonal matrix D2 and U, U capital L is the upper triangular matrix of A. Lastly, the formula. The line do will initiate a loop to iterate from n equals to 1 to n equals to 100. In the loop, the system of linear equation will be solved using linear solve function and the solution will be printed using the print function. Let me just open a new notes to iterate the system. Okay, so I will just copy the code here one by one. And in this video, I will solve this system of linear equation. We can set any numbers for the additional starting point, but I will start with 0, 0, 0. So by pressing the shift and enter key at the same time, you will run the code. And we can see the iteration is a bit too long. So we will use a lower value, which is n is equal to 20. We will run the code uh, once again. And we can see the iteration converts at 10th uh, iteration, where x equals to 3 y equals to 2 and z equals to 1. So that's all for me. Thank you. So I will explain the programming coding for 
Jacobi using rule frame Mathematica. So, as you can see here, the code A equal to 4, 1, 3, 1, 5, 1, 2, negative 1, 8, B equal to 17, 14, 12, and X bracket 1 equal to 0, 0, 0. So here, the code set the coefficient matrix A and the constant vector B. It also initialize the initial guess X bracket 1 for the solution vector. D1 equal to diagonal A, D2 equal to diagonal matrix D1. So, this line extract the diagonal element of matrix A using diagonal A and store them in D1. Then D1 is transformed into diagonal matrix D2 using diagonal matrix D1. And then as we can see here the code NL equals equal to lower triangularized A minus D2 and NU equal to upper triangularized A minus D2. So this line compute the lower triangular part of matrix A using lower triangularized A and subtract D2. Similarly, the upper triangular part of A is obtained using upper triangularized A and subtracting D2 from it. So this computation produces matrices NL and NU. The next part of this code is L equal to negative NL, U equal to negative NU, and ID equal to inverse D2. So this line assign the negative value of NL and NU to LU respectively. The inverse of D2 is computed using inverse bracket D2 and assign it to ID. So the last part is loop. In this loop, the Jacob B iteration is performed iteratively, starting from N1 up to N20. The loop calculates the updated solution of vector X bracket N plus 1 using the Jacobi iteration formula N X bracket N plus 1 equal to inverse D2 times LU times L plus U times XN plus B as you can see in this code. So the result is assigned to X bracket N plus 1, then the current iteration number N and the formatted solution vector XN are print using print. The matrix form function is used to format the matrix output. So when we run the code, we can see here that this iteration will converge at X18. That's all from me. Thank you. This is comparison between Gauss-Seidel and Jacobi method. So, we see that method, both method is iterative method. And this is formula for Jacobi method. This also for, this is formula for Gauss-Seidel method. About the convergence, for Jacobi methods, it converges for diagonally dominant or symmetric positive definite matrix. For Gauss-Seidel method, it converge for diagonal dominant or symmetric positive definite matrix. About speed, it's slow than Gauss-Seidel for Jacobi methods. This is about the convergence. And uh, for Gauss-Seidel, it's faster than Jacobi method. About the memory, more memory needed than Gauss-Seidel method because it stores two solution vectors for each iteration. And for Gauss-Seidel method, Less memory needed than Jacobi method as it updates only one component of the solution vector at time. I've been searching for this all my life.